Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Friday the 11th of March. Actually, it's nearly Saturday. I'm working a bit late today. Now, um, but just before we get on to some interesting uh, things about the, uh, the vaccine side effects that we wanted to clarify, uh, there's a story that needs clarified here on this now, we looked at this a couple of days ago. Treatment with ivermectin is associated with decreased mortality in COVID-19 patients. And it's an analysis of a, a national federated database. It's, the, it's an abstract from a uh, um, conference, conference paper presentation. And we did look at this conclusion here. Ivermectin use was associated with decreased mortality in patients with COVID-19 compared to remdesivir. All so far, so good. But I was actually listening to Dr. Bean today, and, and he, he thinks this, this has been withdrawn. So I checked on this, and it does in fact appear that this has been withdrawn. Uh, as reported uh, here in, um, in AP News, apparently the abstract is flawed. Uh, flawed research abstract, so there's something wrong with it. Now, given that um, the abstract is flawed, that means everything I've said about it is flawed, <laughs> obviously, because I could only say what was in the abstract. So everything we've said is, is completely uh, null and void. It, it's, been, it's been withdrawn. But it's a bit strange because this, this is the live link here. That's the live link. So, And there's nothing to say it's withdrawn on there. Now, what you would normally expect is this example here of a, a retracted paper. And I think you'll agree with me, that's pretty unambiguously uh, retracted, but not so on that one. So um, quite what's going on there, not entirely clear, but it does look like it's been withdrawn. So anything we said about it is predicated on, on nothing because the abstract's been withdrawn. It essentially no longer exists. So I do apologise for you wasting 10 minutes of your time watching that video. And I'm also a bit annoyed that I wasted several hours of my life reading and preparing it. Um, so it's, it's completely null and void now. But still a little strange. So it'd be nice to have an unambiguous uh, sort of retracted thingy like that on it. But... There you go, that's uh, what we have. Apparently there's been a lot of kerfuffle on it on Twitter, but I don't really follow Twitter that much, so I'm not really sure, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. Basically, we have to ignore everything we said about it because the abstract is withdrawn and th th therefore it's based on nothing. You can't, uh, you can't put solid footsteps into fresh air. You need solid ground, and if it doesn't exist, it's been taken away. A pity we wasted time on it. Now let's go on to the main topic that I wanted to look at today, which is actually pretty interesting. If I can get into a see, see what we're doing. <laughs> there we go. There's so many technical things you've got to get right all, all at the same time. Um, so so that, that was the references for that one. Um, now a complete list of the Pfizer adverse events of special interest. Now there's no two ways to put this. Um, I made a mistake here, so I apologise uh, unconditionally because this list that we looked at that I, I thought was the list of side effects isn't. Apparently, it's the list that people need to look out for. So this is the list published by Pfizer, and it looks like this list, which is indeed long, are events that doctors and nurses should be looking out for not events that have actually been reported. So no two ways about it. My apologies, I've got, I've got that wrong. Uh, but let's just look at it a little more. Um, so this is adverse events. This is, from the, this is direct screenshots from the paper, adverse events. And then uh, adverse events of special interest. That's from the, uh, that, that's from the whatever you call it, the, the, the bit that tells you what all the titles stand for. And, and this, is, this is the lead into the actual list of side effects. Cumulative analysis of post-authorization adverse events reports. Now, I think the problem here is that it's just not very well phrased. Let me just show you that. But that's it actually, well, it's on top of all of them there. Look, it's, it's on top of all of them. So they're things to look out for. Now, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I didn't know this. And... It turns out that um, several doctors I've talked to, actually on both sides of the pond today, uh, didn't know it either. And in fact, uh, of the several doctors I've talked to, n none of them did know uh, that this list was things they had to look out for. 
Um, so apparently that's what it is. So let's look at it in a little more detail. Now I must confess, because I wasn't very up to date on this, I've, I've basically plagiarised Dr. Jesse uh, Santano on this, who publishes a nice, uh, a nice sort of pre-say of it. So let's look at what Dr. Santano is is saying. Um, so an adverse event of special interest is an event of, for a particular product that should be monitored by a drug or vaccine manufacturing company. So it's something that they should be monitoring for. So in other words, all doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners involved in this should be monitoring for all of these. Now, I've had a look through these. I'm not going to bore you with them now, but um, I can work out what most of them mean. But um, not all of them, I must say. There's some pretty obscure stuff here. I mean, off the cuff, I don't know what fetal syndrome is. I know what a femoral artery embolism is. But, but uh, if, if you see, there's a lot of specialised terminology here. And then at the end, it just kind of... Um, it, just, it just kind of... Eventually, <laughs> it just stops. There, there you go. Um, so... Um, things that doctors have to look out for but but apparently um, most doctors and nurses don't know they have to look out for it now if they don't know they have to look out for it i would have thought this could lead to significant under reporting because the doctors i've talked to didn't know they had to look out for this but let's carry on with dr santano's rather useful analysis um it can be severe or non-serious but it can lead to a serious medical condition and he's going according to this group here uh, this is the Council for International Organisations of Medical Sciences, which seems to be related to the WHO and the United Nations so Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, from memory. <laughs> um, um, so it, it, it does seem to be this recognised uh, recognised agency that's put forward these guidelines. Um, now, Dr Santano again... <laughs> Um, where are we? Uh, such events should be described in protocols or protocol amendments, good, and we see, rightly, that, that that's what Pfizer have done, uh, that that's what this is, um, so they have described it. Um, a pity it took, my understanding is it took a court order to have this paper released, um, so quite how you were exposed to know before the Freedom of Information Court order unless this was in the public domain before, but we looked before and it looked like the, the, this has been released as a result of a court order to me. Um, correct me if you think I'm wrong on that, but that's what it looked like. Um, anyway, uh, and instructions provided for, investi uh, for investigators of how to and when they should report to the sponsor. So I can't see that. I can't see any instructions there on this document as to how you report that. Uh, sorry, you'll be getting dizzy looking at all these going up and down. I can't see anything there before it uh, saying how you report it. And uh, I can't see anything that was after it rather. And I can't see anything before it. I don't think I saw anything before it either. No, it just says the summary there. Um, so can't see that. So they're, they're rightly including it, but I can't see that. I can't see that bit. Um, the organiser, the, the original Pfizer appendix is a wall of words indeed, with the diagnosis separated by semicolons. More than 95% of the adverse events listed are life-changing for the bad, so we certainly don't want those. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a diagnosis from your doctor <laughs> and he says it's not related to the shot, now, <laughs> of course, uh, most of us wouldn't think we were particularly lucky to uh, to have a diagnosis from our doctor, but I think he means if you're lucky enough to be able to see doctors because it is quite difficult at the moment. I I've just had to... Uh, <laughs> My last appointment was on, a, on an e-consult thing. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway. Um, in, and, uh, it, 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 and your doctor, and, and the doctor says it's not related to the shot. Then Dr Santana says, show them this list. So we need to show, if you've got a, any problem that you think might be vaccine related, uh, and your doctor says it's not, then show them this list to make sure it's not in this list because if it is if it is in this list then uh, the adverse event should be reported clearly not a straightforward matter <laughs> but 
that's that's what the guidelines are saying <clears throat> show them this list tell, to <coughs> tell them that Pfizer is watching out for those complications so the, Pfizer put this there because I think they genuinely want to know if they are turning up Dr. Santana again. Many doctors, nurses, uh, practic uh, practitioners, or physicians don't know. Well, well, I didn't know, and the several doctors I've talked to today didn't know either. So uh, it looks like we're pretty ignorant of that. Uh, Dr. Santana says I, 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 I didn't until I read the whole list. So we, we, we are. Well, Dr. Santana is clearly less ignorant than me because at least he knew the, li the list existed. Uh, many of the conditions below are rare. That means doctors might have forgotten about them or, or not know about them. Um, rare also means there may be no standardised treatments for them, which is, um, yeah, that could be a problem. The diagnosis on the list does not mean they always happen with COVID-19 shots, of course not. But anyone who got vaccinated and then diagnosed with the illness, Dr. Santano's inverted commas, I'm not quite sure why I put that in inverted commas, uh, and then diagnosed with the owners below should be reported to Pfizer or theirs. So given that most doctors and nurses from my completely unscientific straw poll <laughs> don't know it exists, how can they report it if they don't know it exists? So um, if you're a nurse practitioner, doctor, physician's assistant, and you know this list exists, pl please tell me I'm wrong, but I didn't know it existed. And several doctors I've talked to today didn't know it existed. The diagnosis may be months or years after the shot. You can still report them. The World Health Organization is also keeping an, an eye on adverse events of special interest, of course. Uh, adverse events of special interest, monitoring, determining if there is a high incidence of specific disease in people who had the COVID shots. Well, we know, for example, that there is an increased risk of uh, heart inflammation. We, we, that, that we established that in yesterday's video and indeed in many others uh, if the incidence is higher in people who've had the shots they should stop using these vaccines well, well the incidence is higher in people that have had the shots so according to this think this thinking from dr santano um well there you go um that's that's what uh, that's what this article is uh, is saying I don't feel I can comment on that, but that's what this article seems to be saying. And these should be getting reported, that is if they do their job. Uh, this list may be from Pfizer, but all who had COVID shots, whatever the manufacturer should report uh, their diagnosis. Of course, of course. This is just a Pfizer paper that we have here. So, um, if doctors don't know about these, then I'm not sure they can accurately uh, accurately report them. I mean, dear me, I mean, metastatic pulmonary embolism, I know what that means. Microangiopathy, I know what that means. But some of them I don't. I mean, yeah, most of them make sense. But some of these are th th things like Miller-Fisher syndrome. I, I can't remember what that is. Uh, mitochondrial aspartate amino transferase increased. Well, I haven't got a clue about that mitochondrial diseases i mean um i, I know an expert in mitochondrial diseases but uh, <laughs> i think if you ask most doctors uh, what mitochondrial aspartate amino transferase increased means they'd be struggling as i am so there you go apologies i got that wrong it is not side effects that have been reported it is it is side effects to look out for um, but as we say, most doctors don't seem to know about it. Now, let's uh, finish with the report from our community health partner in in Africa, in uh, in Uganda. And um, Rafa is going to report on the state of the pandemic in uh, Africa and Uganda. And the news seems to be pretty good. So over to Rafa and thank you, Rafa, as always. Hello everyone, welcome to today's COVID-19 update. I'm here to give you a brief report about Africa. As per today, Africa has confirmed a cumulative number of over 11.3 million COVID-19 cases uh, with a cumulative number of over 10.5 uh, million recoveries. 
And that means about 98% uh, of all the people who got infected with COVID-19 in Africa have recovered. And Africa has lost a total of around uh, 250,000 people uh, to COVID-19. So uh, that's the brief information that I have on Africa so far. Uh, but when you look at the rate at which the cases are increasing, it is low compared to the time uh, when we had Delta variant. And now let's uh, look briefly at Uganda. I've not been able to get the vaccination information on Africa, uh, but when I get it, uh, I will be able to give you. So let's look at Uganda. Uh, Uganda today confirmed a total of around uh, 15 new cases uh, out of a total of around uh, 2,393 uh, tests conducted. This gives us a positivity rate of around 0.6%. Uh, so this is low compared to Delta variant, and as I told you, uh, things so far, uh, we, we, they are moving on well in Uganda. Because as we talk, uh, the economy is fully open, people gather freely, people, people are enjoying uh, the atmosphere now compared uh, to the time when COVID-19 had just come. And the exciting news is that uh, despite of the fully opening up of the economy, uh, we have seen that the cases are still low. So we thank God for that and we thank uh, God for the health workers, uh, for all the work that they have done uh, to try to keep uh, this uh, virus low. And we thank God also for Omicron variant, uh, which came as a vaccine uh, for all the people. So uh, when you look at a uh, uh, the cumulative number of cases, uh, Uganda has now about uh, 163,446 cases uh, with a cumulative number of around uh, 197 cases. About 35 people are the ones who are admitted right now, or the people who are in hospitals. That includes people who are in ICU and people who have some moderate uh, signs and symptoms. So this is exciting uh, because we have over 35 treatment centers across the whole country. So if that is the case, it means some treatment centers are empty as I'm talking right now. Uh, when it comes to vaccination, uh, Uganda has administered around 16,672,943 uh, vaccines. So that includes the people who have received the first and second dose. The people who have completed all the doses, the two, are about uh, 7 million. Thank you very much for watching today's updates. See you in the next video. Bye. Excellent, thank you, Ifafa. Um, great report as always. Quarter of a million deaths in Africa. It could have been so much worse. Really, that is, I'd expected it to be many more than that. So terrible, but I'm really quite relieved that it wasn't in the many, many millions. Cases in Uganda, 15, 0.6% positivity. Everything's fully open. Everyone's completely back to normal. Interesting statement there, with Afa, th we thank God for Omicron. Interesting statement, I'll leave you to make what you will of that. Um, if you're a theist, then you can thank God for Omicron. If you're not, then, then you can decide whether uh, Omicron has been remarkably fortuitous or not. In all of Uganda, 35 people in hospital, despite very, very low vaccination rates. So it looks like the immunity, which is so obviously now being enjoyed in, in Uganda, is primarily as a result of uh, natural exposure. And it's um, Omicron just seems to have sort of finished that job off fairly nicely, and I would be optimistic. Um, 
given that things have gone so well in Uganda, um, it will be interesting to see what happens. Presumably, uh, there's going to be a period of endemicity. It's not going to go away completely, but that will be interesting to follow. So it looks like they're well into their endemic phase now, uh, whereas we're just sort of uh, entering into that more slowly or, or with a delay in our highly vaccinated uh, Western uh, cultures. Okay, so... Um, Dodgy, ab well, dodgy, withdrawn, ab withdrawn abstract. Therefore, anything I said about that is wrong, and this was a simple mistake that I made. So, hopefully, that, hopefully that's clarified, and uh, all doctors and nurses and practitioners now know to look out for all of these potential side effects. Let's uh, hope that is the case. Although I am. Um, not entirely sure it is. Thank you for watching.